Our show is now on Stitcher. Listen to us on your iPhone, Android phone, Kindle Fire, and other devices with Stitcher. Stitcher is smart radio for your phone. Find it in your app store or on Stitcher.com. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Pray with me, if you will. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come with the fire and burn. Come with the rain and cleanse. Come with the wind and breathe. Come with the light and reveal. Convict us, convert us, consecrate us. Claim and call us with your care and concern, O God, until we do something. Amen. Amen. Scholars tell us that the verses from this lesson come in the heart of a larger section, which includes uh, chapter 2 through chapter 7. In general, chapters 4 and 5 include a discourse on the character and content of valid Christian ministry. These chapters hearken back to Paul's comments in chapter 3, where he states that we do what we do in the name of of uh, Christ Jesus is important. Reminding the readers of the sacrificial giving in service to others of Jesus. In these verses, Paul states that, and at times outright declares, his confidence in the ministry he he proclaims despite adversity. Paul articulates a clear distinction between his finite humanity and the infinite power of God. For him, this is necessary uh, to state in order that the divine power to have effect in the Christian community. He uh, refers to Psalm uh, 116.10 to make his case. As the psalmist believed and so spoke, so too the apostle believes and speaks. Paul uses the psalm as a scriptural uh, precedent to establish the truth of his ministry. His point is this, faith for him is a gift from God that is defined by God. This is what ministry is for Paul. For, for Paul. Uh, God directed faithful proclamation. The apostle then states his confidence in the character of his work so that he states the content of his message. God who raised Jesus will raise faithful servants as well. Another important aspect for Paul is the understanding that all valid Christian service is for other believers unto the glory of God. He says he is willing to risk his all despite the reality of adversity because God sustains him. One scholar states that the odd reference by Paul to inner and outer persons are part of the dualistic anthropological uh, language of his day. But from the context, we may paraphrase, and here's the, the paraphrase by the scholar. We can spend our life in this world for God because God is already giving us new life that will endure beyond the present, even into the context of God's new creation which has already appeared, but is not yet fully present. To illustrate his point, Paul sets a series of contrasts between lesser and greaters. In each of these pairs, he points out the inferiority of present existence in comparison with God's promise, which is already being made real. This thoughtful reasoning tells how the apostle interpreted the hardships endured in the course of his ministry and how he understood his work to be made possible by God. One dictionary defined uh, definition of thoughtfulness is showing consideration for others characterized by or manifesting careful thought, as in a thoughtful essay. Another definition uh, is occupied with or given to thought, templative, meditative, careful, needful, mindful, are correlative uh, 
definition. I personally found it interesting to note that in the dictionary I used, Random House, uh, Webster's uh, College Dictionary, uh, the very next listing after thoughtfulness is thoughtlessness, or the diametric opposite of thoughtful. To some, being thoughtful might not seem requisite for being an active Christian, that is, but that is exactly what Paul seems to be saying. And if we look at, at the ministry of Jesus, it seems to be filled with thoughtful, mindful lessons. From the Sermon on the Mount, to the Lord's Prayer, to the parabolic teachings about the workers in the vineyard, to the woman at the well, to reaching out to those on the margins, the least, the lost, and the lonely. Jesus is asking us to think deeper and with greater compassion than we believe possible. The same is true here with Paul. He is saying that there is risk when doing ministry in the name of a holy, compassionate love. But states boldly, does Paul, that it is worth the risk. A couple of illustrations on risk and thoughtfulness. Early uh, Steiner is a baseball announcer for the Los Angeles Dodgers, not the baseball announcer. We know that that's Vin Scully who's been doing that for 65 years. But Charlie Steiner is a, a good announcer, and I've witnessed an interview he's had, I've, I've uh, seen it several times now, uh, where he was interviewing uh, Andrew Friedman, the um, young president of baseball operations for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Charlie asked him first about leaving Wall Street to become a baseball executive, uh, where he first served with the uh, uh, Oakland Athletics, then with the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, and now with the Dodgers. Charlie same, said it seemed like an odd transition. Uh, transition. Uh, Andrew said, not really. You see, I loved and played baseball my whole life from Little League to college, in college, I realized I didn't have the talent to play ball beyond that level, and I needed another career, hence Wall Street. The difference, he went on to say, between the two careers is the difference between dreading getting up and going to work as I did on Wall Street and being excited each day to be part of baseball. Steiner then said, I've heard a story that you have 90 baseball cards signed by Tim Raines. Andrew said, yes, that is true. Charlie then said, but you grew up in Texas, and Tim Raines played for the Montreal Expos. Explain that. He said, Steiner, I don't know. I just, he was my favorite player. And the story happened this way. Andrew approached uh, Tim Raines for an autograph, but as he was searching for the perfect one among the 90 in his possession, imagine that, 90 baseball cards of one player, the 90 in his possession, Mr. Raines stopped him and said, can you be here tomorrow? And Andrew, Andrew said, sure. Tim Raines took all the cards and returned them the next day, signed, all 90 of them signed. So the question is, who was more thoughtful, the kid with the 90 cards or the ball player who signed them all? Charlie asked one last question about if Andrew could vote for the Hall of, Pain, Hall of Fame, meaning would he vote for Tim Raines? Andrew cut him off mid-sentence and said, absolutely. More than 20 years after the fact, you could tell from his voice how much this meant to him years later. Thoughtful. Lisa Mulcahy writes on health issues for the LA Times, and on June 6th, she wrote an article titled, Steps to Ease the Strain of Social Media. I've referred to this uh, last week, so I'm talking about Twitter and, and Facebook and, and the like. So, the Steps to Ease the Strain of Social Media. It deals with some of the issues we talked about last week in one part of the article, she states, quote, if you're like most of the world, you make time for following friends on social media. In fact, 71% of adults who go online use Facebook, and 23% use Twitter, according to the 
Rescue uh, Research Center. That isn't a bad thing. Positive posting and communication can be a real boost to your confidence and a sense of connection to others. It can be easy, though, to uh, flip unconsciously into un less helpful behavior on social media. And that can lead to anxiety and depression. It says if you want to beat that Facebook funk, New research has identified which habits can lead to trouble and how to change your social media perspective to improve, improve your mood and outlook. Uh, she goes on to uh, state um, uh, a study uh, by the University of Houston found that buying into the details of others' postings on Facebook can lead to symptoms of depression. If you're looking at your college, for example, if you're looking at your college roommate's wildly romantic honeymoon, it is normal to feel inadequate if you are single. Because Facebook gives opportunity for presenting our best self, this causes false perceptions with regard to what has happened personally and, and the sense of connection. Ms. Mulcahy says if you're feeling envious, simply stop lurking. Not looking, lurking. If you are checking up on people and not feeling great about it, ask yourself, why are you doing this? And I especially liked her final thought. Don't tweet or post your every thought, meaning have an internal edit. What I found great about this article was a couple of people came out last week and essentially said the same things to me as Ms. Mulcahy. So it's important to uh, be involved with technology, but not to be involved to a detriment. Um, so w now we've heard some fairly positive and somewhat negative elements with regard to said technology on Facebook and Twitter. Let's take a moment and consider a possible spiritual aspect, both negative and positive. There have been uh, several posts on the internet about a celebrity uh, couple buying Disneyland for a day to celebrate their child's birthday. I know the name of the couple, but they don't need the publicity here and now, so I'm, I'm not going to list them. Um, my thought, first thought upon hearing this was, well, good for them. Who wouldn't want to create a really special day for a child? Also, they are not the first to do such things. Those of us who were alive when El Elvis roamed the earth, uh, remember hearing of him uh, doing this very same thing with a variety of establish establishments regularly. There were some negative postings, though. What one person said so powerfully to me last week about this whole uh, social media and technology issue is, you know, we have the power to turn this stuff off. We can just turn it off. How true is that? Wonderful. The positive and thoughtful aspect of these technologies comes to us in an unusual story, the story of Caitlyn Jenner. I first knew her as Bruce. She won a gold medal in the 1976 Summer Olympics. I've followed the emergence into womanhood, her emergence into womanhood over the last year on the inter internet. I read the transcript of the interview with Diane Sawyer last month, then followed the magazine article, photo shoot, and interview. Personal perception, I don't think this acceptance, the acceptance, would have been possible 10 or 15 years ago. Think about it for just a few seconds. It wouldn't have been possible. I just, I, I don't see it because we have this ability to communicate. Who among us would deny the right to be who they feel they are? Friends, I grew up with the phrase, if you can't say anything good about someone, don't say anything at all. I attributed this great thought to Mary P. McDonald, the sage philosopher who gave me birth. I know it wasn't her original thought, but I thought so for many, many years. 
I've since found a thought that I like even more, attributed to author Alice Lee Roosevelt Longworth, who lived from 1884 to 1980, almost made a hundred. And the quote is this, if you can't say anything good about someone, sit right here by me. It was embroidered on a pillow in her sitting room. Hear it again, please. If you can't say anything good about someone, sit right here by me. That's a thought that is both thoughtful thought worthy. May it ever be so. Amen. Let us stand as we affirm our faith and sing our closing hymn. Five, four, eight. the grace we experience in the way and work and wonder of Jesus, and the loving nurture and nudges we gain from the Spirit. Rest in our hearts and minds. This Thank you for listening to the First United Methodist Church podcast, which is recorded live every week at 4832 Tahunga Avenue in North Hollywood, California, and delivered by Dr. Joey McDonald. For more info on us, please check out nohofumc.com or find us on Facebook and Twitter under NoHoFUMC. Thank you.